Okay, folks, introduction to cloud computing and big data slash data engineering, part S. And uh, this one is going to be focusing on uh, sort of Gartner's or maybe general view of the future of cloud computing. Um, and the explicit topics covered are here, Gartner's cloud computing hype cycle and its priority matrix. Hyperscale computing, which sort of intrigues me because it's roughly what I do. Serverless, again, I mentioned the importance of this. Cloud native and microservices. So, so these last three are meant to be the cloud developments which will have the most important impact in the near future, three, three years time, that type of time frame. All right. All right, we'll start this uh, lesson with a couple of Lies from Kleiner Perkins, Mary Meeker, describing um, what you, how you know you, the power of computers in measured say in the first case by compute computing capability per dollar is what you get for a thousand dollars of computer equipment um, as a function of time from the IBM tabulator or abacus or some whatever it was initially. Um, which was not very many calculations per second. And uh, up here we're getting up to um, 10 giga operations per second. And this is uh, 1900, and here we are 2020 or something. And we have here the corresponding graph for storage, either measured as price per gigabyte, vroom, dike the way down. Or capacity of a single disk going up to some 10 terabytes a day. And they're both showing the, these are plotted in a rather extreme scale. Uh, this one only run, doesn't go back to 1900, goes back to um, probably, I don't know, it's a bit unfair. There's not much plotted in, in 1956. I don't know what this is here. Anyway, it's not much, it really starts around 1980. And goes to 2017, and it just is dramatic. I still remember when I used these floppy disks, and I I built the first parallel computer in the world, and we fought our we fought hard. I remember talk, working with the computer science people at uh, Caltech, and we were designing this parallel computer, and they said we want to force people to work in parallel. We'll get them 16 kilobytes of memory on every computer. That will force them to chop the problem up into really small parts. I said, no, I can't do a real problem without that, without 128 kilobytes. That is kilobytes, not megabytes or gigabytes, kilobytes. And we were, did lots of good work with lots of nice papers with 128 kilobytes per now. So we've changed. It just has crept up on us. And as I say, we're now swimming in this collaborative, continuous computing environment generated by these changes. And the second slide is a slightly different uh, type of um, increase. Here's the amount of the internet connection, now up to 50%. And over here we have the social media, 33%. They're both tracking each other at about the same slope. And presumably they will, there may be some areas of the um, of the world where this will not happen for a long time, but it will be more. Effectively, we will live in a world where internet and social media are totally pervasive. So that's the world we're living in, and that's just gonna keep on going. But the fact that internet is 50% says that the impact of the increase in the internet um, um, universal connection is capped at another factor of two. So, we can't get a lot more, we have to deal with it. I mean, so we can look at the people we have now to see what, uh, what's exciting. Right. Uh, so this is again Internet Trends, uh, which uh, is looking at cloud evolution. And uh, they sort of support the same trends you get from Gartner and listening to Amazon, namely containers and microservices are highlighted. Well, that's what. We keep stressing. Um, software delivery, uh, how you actually deliver capabilities to people. 
databases which are very um, very flexible, namely they're distributed, very large, they support analytics, and they're uh, they, uh, elastic, they grow in size. And um, here you have big query, Redshift, and I must admit I do not know what Snowflake is. We can look that up. Edge computing is another one I stress many times. Ed, um, that actually does two things. It puts the source of data away from the cloud. It has the fog which is away from the cloud, but the cloud is still critical. The cloud is the coordinating and ultimate source of infinite computing for the edge. Here we have the hype cycle for cloud computing. So let's see what we have here. We have serverless. Not so bad. Blockchain, edge computing, hyperscale, digital business platform. Remember, we talked about digital business before. IoT platform, um, container management, function as a service, machine learning, um, software defined anything. That's a pretty, I mean, a cloud office, hybrid cloud. Um, Database platform as a service, so infrastructure as a service. Cloud computing is here, it's finally been located on the slope of enlightenment in the cloud computing hype cycle. But it's not too important enough now as an emerging technology to be on the emerging technology um, uh, hype cycle. Also, it's noticed these are different analysts. Uh, it was the fellow who did the emerging technologies, it's called Walker. They're published at essentially the same time, and I assume that. Gardner's aware of possible inconsistency that cloud computing appears in one hype cycle on the slope of enlightenment and it's just disappeared. I, I think it's slightly irrelevant because the implication is the same. It's a mature technology. All right, priority matrix. Um, well, uh, here we have uh, cloud computing is transformational. That's what we like. Edge computing is transformational. Hybrid cloud computing is transformational. IoT platform, machine learning, platform as a service, hyperscale computing, my favorite. And then we have here one which uh, internal cloud service brokerage, that's uh, putting brokers which make decisions for you inside, in the, inside the cloud. And um, an economy for APIs, namely that APIs generate a marketplace and a Vigorous activity. Cloud Office, that's Office 365 extended. Um, and here we have basic cloud capabilities, infrastructure as a service. Blockchain. It's interesting that blockchain is not viewed as murderer because it's so hyped. It's really hyped, blockchain, because it's partly co connected to um, Bitcoin. But um, cloud management platforms, I would view those, maybe they're just so. I don't know why they're only moderate, they're pretty important. I says function as a service. I think function as a service is very important. And here's serverless. I would rate serverless and function as service as more than moderately important. This is in container management. I would put that up there as more important. So I think they've slightly underestimated some of these core technologies which are establishing the ecosystems to support containers. On clouds, I think that that's going to have a lot of um, importance. Whereas things like multi-cloud, which is putting lots of complicated clouds together, I don't think that's so important. That sort of will happen automatically, just to make better use of infrastructure. But I don't think it will be as important as the ability to use serverless computing to, to really lower everybody's development time. So in this slide, we I just give you three of the definitions. Hyperscale computing, which just to say is defined as computing at a massive scale. It's large, effectively impl implying larger scale than before. What an industrialized scale means, I'm not certain. Because um, industrialization has a, a connotation of making everything very big and um, Setting up giant organizations to do things. And this has to be done at all levels. The data center facility itself, the hardware, the system infrastructure, 
them in the system software and the application software. Um, cloud service brokerage is a, a model where s somebody acts as a broker to provide these cloud services. And um, that could be both public clouds and private cloud services. And this is a, the internal version of this is when that's all done internally to an organization. Uh, I, don't quite, I don't think that's quite so exciting to me. I put this in here because I didn't know what cloud service brokerage meant. Cloud bursting is a well-known technology which there's a lot of research that's being done on. Where the idea is to view the, view the cloud as a backup, the Mother's Day backup. When your local facilities run out of resources, you just ship those jobs, there are jobs which aren't being processed to a back end cloud. Um, and though it's a perfectly reasonable way of getting elasticity uh, without trying to change your basic infrastructure. So this is a good way to expand your. Your work, you start off with a sort of fixed resource, your current internal cluster, and you add public clouds on demand when they're needed. Okay, here's yet another hype cycle. This hype cycle is for cloud computing. Um, and it actually has even cloud computing on the hype cycle. Here it is, it's over here. Cloud computing. Um, and actually, in some of these hype cycles, there's cloud computing, and in some, they're not. It's sort of, even here, they're pretty near the plateau of productivity, and they're just halfway through the slope of enlightenment. You know, and I think that's just in the eye of the beholder. Here we have classic cloud computing things, very near mature infrastructure as a service, software as a service, and so on. Um, Platform as a service. These are all pretty mature, not so exciting. Here we have, what do we have? Blockchain, platform as a service, the software to enable blockchains. I'm not quite certain what site reliability engineering is. You can, I can give you this reference to find it, but it's not so exciting. Here we have serverless, platform as a service. That's exciting. The software to enable platform as a service. Sorry, to enable serviceless and to allow people to. Program all these nifty microservices, a sand for that, where you know you have this sort of bunch of sand, which are all these uh, microservices that are just laying there. And every now and then you tickle it by sending it a message, and it wakes up and does its thing. That's the way you architect these, these computers. You try to build everything so that it can be, it's got, it's modular, no interference, and it's just, and it can be built independently, so that when you have your software team, each member of the team only does one microservice. Up here we have giant computing, hyperscale, we have edge computing. We have container management, we have multiple clouds. We have IoT platform, the software to enable IoT. We still have machine learning on this one. Sometimes some of these plots, machine learning is broken up into different things. Cloud native. How to write code so that they run well on clouds, as opposed to running well on hippopotami or whatever else you use to program for. Um, we have uh, marketplaces for cloud, or networking for cloud, and then we have our favorite thing we've seen before, software-defined infrastructure. Hybrid cloud computing, how you run on your favorite old-fashioned university infrastructure, you burst to a cloud when you need it. Hybrid cloud computing. That's the, I don't quite say, I mean, cloud, hybrid cloud computing enables cloud person, which is a separate entry. So these are all fun stuff. Here is the same thing as priority uh, matrix, hyperscale computing, giant computing is my, it's still my favorite one in these areas. And um, it's five to 10 years, transformational, and the only one in that. Edge computing is probably more important. Because uh, it's really, it actually, I think this is not right. Edge computing is revolutionary and not quite clear how to do it. Hyperscale is clear how to do it. Hybrid cloud computing, that is clear, clear how to do it. Machine learning, well, basic machine learning we know how to do, but it's so big, there's so many things that to do it properly is hard. Platform as a service is very important, and it probably isn't uh, universally adopted, so it actually has a way to go. Whereas software as a service, actually putting an application on the cloud, 
is like cloud computing. Transformation is essentially happening now. The API economy, the fact that you define your services to have interfaces, uh, API's application uh, interface is um, very, very important. And of course, down here we have all sorts of good things with the word cloud in it. Private cloud computing, which I don't like very much, but we, it's um, basically declaring what you do at your local place of cloud, which you can do, um, but it's sort of in the eye of the beholder. And there's lots of little things here with fancy names, uh, but and I don't know why serverless platform as a service is not revolutionary. It's pretty important in my opinion. Anyway. So these things at the top, I mean, there's these, these hype cycles are a little in the eye of the beholder in some cases. But the basic thrust is undeniable, where we want to work on. We want to work on hybrid computing, machine learning, the various as a services. And we want to build these at the highest scale possible, and it must link to the edge. So that's where we are. Thank you very much. Now we can look and see how how it compares. Okay, so this as I am rumored on the last slide, uh, this slide compares 2017 to 2018, which are pretty similar, because I have well, actually just done both of them. Um, cloud computing is sometimes in and sometimes out. And we had various transformational technologies in 2018, which have really seem to have highlighted better than 2017, what's important. Absolutely. To flying things as a service, edge computing, hybrid cloud computing, machine learning, building software that just enables other software to be written, platform as a service, and making everything support largest possible capabilities, hyperscale computing. That's where the actions are, and that's what you would use to build your continuous collaborative computing treacle, which will enable your everybody. Actually, it's not really treacle because it's making you run fast. So it's a wind, it's blowing you through the world, making your world better and better. Okay, that's the end of this particular section. Okay, here are some typical remarks and diagrams about serverless computing and function as a service. Here is a question when I use Azure Cosmos DB <coughs> or Amazon Kinesis, do I need to allocate a server for it? Or deploy a virtual machine? No, of course not. You just configure them from the portal and use them. That's the whole purpose of serverless. What happens if I want a simple function? Why don't you just do it with serverless? If you want to run a function at two every day at 2 p.m., you just set up an event to trigger it at 2 p.m. And you can set up events based on all sorts of things. A file being modified, a GitHub repository, or just any other, maybe a, an edge computing event being added to the event stream. And you can do these in various ways. You can have a VM and a container, and you run Kafka con, um, continuously, and it receives these events. Or you run Cosmos DB continuously, and it accepts these events. But then you pay even when they're idle, whereas you really would prefer to pay for um, just when it's used. And so serverless has this big advantage of being paid by the time used. And then we have these examples, Lambda, Azure Function, Lambda's of course from Amazon, Google Functions, IBM Apache, OpenWhisk, uh, IBM trying to catch up, donated their software to Apache. And then over here we have uh, the evolution of Data center computing, bare metal, virtual machines, containers, functions. These are the units of activity. And then over here we have some timing and effort estimates on premises. There are data center, virtual machines in some like cloud, containers in the cloud or serverless in the cloud. Time for to make it initiated is week to month to buy new stuff for your data center, minutes to get a VM running. Seconds to minutes for containers, milliseconds for serverless. The utilization correspondingly increases. Serverless packs, it being at the smallest grain size, packs everything in. The charging is capital exp expenditure here for on premises, and of course, VMs are charged by the hour, containers by the minutes, 
and serverless by the milliseconds. So that's pretty good, isn't it? Here's a, a slide I drew which sort of illustrates uh, it. This comes from Alex Zeminski, the slide over here, which shows um, function as a service over here as a subset of event-driven computing, because the functions are invoked by events. And <coughs> inside function as a service, we have these various implementations, which you mentioned, as well as the three commercial ones and OpenWhisk, which is sort of commercial as IBM, but also Apache. There is Open Lambda from Wisconsin. And then you could view peer-to-peer -peer as serverless, because it's not using centralized services. And serverless overlaps with event-driven computing, which overlaps with function as a service. There was an old project called GridSolve from the grid computing days, which was essentially function as a service. If you go and buy this today, there's short-running stateless computation done in those functions. But I expect that to change. We already know it's meant to be cloud-native. We know it's meant to be event-driven. We know it's meant to be very elastic. And it charges at the millisecond granularity. So this, these are just all the features of serverless function as a service. All right, here's some wise words from Gartner on serverless computing. And it's sort of interesting that they see this, they've said this before, that serverless will be supporting the use of computing outside the central organization, because serverless allows an individual to invoke their own servers. And this is rapid scalability, operational simplicity, on-demand pricing have made them, made serverless popular. Um, so they're limited on what they can do now, because they can run small functions. There's a five minute limit on most of these commercial products and implicit limits on size. Um, that is usually fine for an event-driven use case if you're Smartphone generates an event that doesn't usually take up to anywhere near five minutes to process it. Um, here's a quote of a related thing that two thirds of server workload will be deployed off premises, off your uh, internal data center. And this is driven by the workload migration to public clouds and by new server investments by the hosting people and the public cloud service providers. So the number of local loads is going to double. Um, this will not really ha ha show anything on, uh, for on premises. In fact, we showed in an earlier slide the expectation of a few percent per year decrease in the on premises facilities per year with a 19% increase of clouds per year. And then we have, um, I defined here hyperconvergence. I also did hyperscale for computing. Hyperconvergence is, again, largely a marketing term. It just says everything is converged, which is probably not a good idea. You want to keep everything nice and modular. And um, you have a single vendor, and that person supports everything. That's probably a bad idea. The whole purpose of the cloud is to have multiple vendors, a good mix of software, hopefully open source, and um, and not go to integrated systems. Integrated systems have lots of problems. You really need to know what you're doing before you do that. And I say hyperconvergence is just a buzzword sold by people hyperconverging, by vendors who sell hyperconverging systems, which means they sell their own system, whether or not it's the best system. And so these integrated systems, of course, increase complexity and probably have the opposite impact from what people want. Here's a few more wise remarks about serverless computing. Um, so obviously it's huge advantage you do not have to operate the infrastructure. And it allows developers. So this is all, this is, they keep focusing on developers. You, the developer, will just spawn off your serverless computing running inside some public or private cloud. Um, so it supports horizontal scaling as long as the back end resources are auto scaling. And scalability is just a software design issue. So you don't actually you don't have to actually worry about the infrastructure. Amazon will worry about it and provide the elasticity. Um, 
And also, you only pay for what you do. Do you pay a little more per second, but if you only pay for the second you use, in general, as long as your job is um, period, uh, sporadic, namely it doesn't run. If it runs flat out continuously, you shouldn't use functional serverless computing because it's more efficient. Um, it's cheaper to just buy by the hour. Um, and this with um, this allows the serverless to use truly on-demand consumption. Currently, it's very likely used. It's partly the immaturity of the technology, the five-minute limit. And today, event-driven is not so common, and event-driven is central to serverless computing. We expect event-driven to grow in importance, uh, because it's a very natural technology. Everything from the edge is event-driven. Because something will arrive from the edge, will that better generate an event? <clears throat> and many things which are not done event driven can be made event driven. So when you launch your, uh, when you do your workflow, you can make each step of that workflow be invoked by an event. You just don't do it today because it's sort of not necessary, but you can do it that way and then use this type of approach. Here we have a little bit on cloud native. Uh, there's a nice talk by Dennis Gannon about this at uh, this link here. Uh, here is a nice uh, blog about uh, cloud native. And the reason to do cloud native, it makes the best use of this cloud special features. Because clouds are traded off elasticity versus fault tolerance. So they're more, fault to they're more likely to fail than a traditional HPC cluster, but they're much more flexible and elastic. Uh, then the other feature of cloud native is microservices, containers, and functions, which is meant, which has all these, uh, which provides the modularity and to support scalable parallelism, rapid modification, and the ease of providing fault tolerance because you have these stateless functions running. And here's some examples of uh, cloud native applications: Netflix, Facebook, Twitter, Google Docs. Azure Cosmos DB, Azure Event Hub, Fontana, uh, IoT Hub, AWS uh, Genesis. Okay, serverless, I mean, as of course, cloud native. So, cloud native is um, uses DevOps. These are the things you need to put together. Uh, you use a continuous delivery software engineering approach. You use microservices if you want to make small functions, and that's what microservices are. And we use containers as they're lightweight and therefore suitable for packaging lots and lots of functions in. Whereas virtual machines would be a catastrophe. We'll have tiny functions and 10,000% uh, more data, more bytes uh, taken up by the operating system. Um, so if you do cloud native and microservices, they will be self-managing infrastructure because of the automation of DevOps plus these. Um, cloud native is probably easier to make fault tolerant because it's event driven and stateless. Um, then you can probably get hopefully better insight from these modular software approaches. Uh, hopefully you build in security, whether that's uh, wishful thinking, I don't know. Certainly, this is more efficient. Containers are lighter weight. Functional services now is close packing of all the functions in available core, uh, idle cores, which the traditional, more monolithic, larger system is much harder to fit a large system in, a, in an idle core. Whereas you have thousands of small functions, you can fit those into idle cores. Um, and teams have grown in size, and the applications have grown in size, a factor of 10 over the last few years. And this microservices break large applications into smaller pieces, and they can be developed, tested, and managed independently. And so that is a good approach to software engineering. Okay, here we come to the latest the Gartner hype cycle for cloud computing. It's actually less. To me, less hypey, because I work on cloud so much that most of these concepts strike me as either pretty well understood or not so far from being understood. 
Um, we will see here um, things like serverless platform as a service. Well, serverless is obviously still being deployed and developed, but it's pretty clear what it's, what's going on and why it's a good idea. Multi-cloud has been studied in the research community for a long time. It's uh, trying to articulate the idea in a service world. You might want to take an Amazon service and a Microsoft service and uh, Indiana University uh, service and join them together. So that's the multi-cloud concept. Here we have edge computing, where we know the intelligent cloud has to join the intelligent edge. And that intelligent cloud and edge must all be joined by some middleware software infrastructure called AI platform as a service. And then we need to have on the edge the IoT platform. And actually, we're going to always think of these as cloudlets, at least the world involving what's not, a cloudlet is not a universally agreed term. Usually, people just think of the edge, there is computing at the edge. That computing is naturally going to be similar to clouds, because if you're sitting on the right at the edge, you're a little piece of smart dust lying on the floor, and you're communicating with something. You don't know whether that something is a cloud or something much nearer. Something much nearer will be a cloudlet. It's a piece of small piece of infrastructure nearer the edge, and it's put there so you get better response. And, but on the other hand, it should run as much as possible the same software as the cloud. And so that's why it's a cloudlet. It's like a cloud, but smaller. But it doesn't, you want to really, we want to make it as near a cloud as possible. Here we have some slightly related concepts. Um, hybrid cloud computing, or more generally hybrid IT, where we're running some on the public cloud, some on the private cloud. Getting between them, we burst with the great bigger when we run out of uh, run out of uh, resources on our private system. We rush off to the public system. Uh, we can actually use the fact that clouds are dominant and wonderful, and put the same software on our private system as we do on our public system. Then it's called private cloud computing. It doesn't actually have to be in the same. Uh, on a public cloud, it, or it doesn't have to actually be in your own institution. It could be anywhere, but it's just yours, so it's very secure. Here we even have basic cloud computing rushing up the slope of enlightenment, and with software as a service even ahead of it. I would say I wouldn't put. Well, I guess cloud computing being so big and having some uncertain parts, maybe you put it behind software as a service, which is providing applications as a service or infrastructure as a service, which is providing computers as a service. That, of course, is being replaced by serverless. Okay, let's get on to the next slide. Which uh, points out that if you look at those innovations there, there are at least three clusters. Uh, there is the true innovation, cloud native, distributed clouds, uh, platform as a service for AI and things like that. Um, <coughs> Blockchain. Then we have the um, hype of the day, which is serverless, multi cloud, and container management. Then we're on the top of the curve. And then we have the trough, which is private cloud computing, cloud bursting, cloud access security brokers, which is somewhat struggling because, not because they're technically impossible, it's just hard to implement. Whenever you mix things up, it's a real mess. I mean, if you're living in a pure Google world, or a pure Amazon world, or a pure Indian University world, it's at least you know who's in charge and who makes decisions. When you're running around between them, it's much harder. So that field has always had difficulties. When it was called grid computing, it had lots and lots of difficulties, and actually that field collapsed. That was the view that you would not Think of things as uh, un isolated units, but just everything is spread around, talking to each other. Well, jobs are running anywhere. That failed mainly for these uh, social or bureaucratic reasons. People own things, and it was very difficult to negotiate with them. Even when they wanted to work with you. If we look from 2018 to 2019, there have been a huge number of changes. Look at all the things that have disappeared. Uh, some of these I don't know so much. Hyperscale computing, I know that's the uh, use of large, very large clusters. That is certainly happening. It's probably not. It's not so exciting because 
There is a difference between 4 nodes and 4,000 nodes. There is not a difference between 4,000 nodes and 400,000 nodes. Once you can do 4,000 nodes, you can probably do more. Machine learning is present there in the different forms. It's still critical. APIs, that's a marketplace of APIs and services. That's here, the marketplace. Software defined, well, everything has to be software defined, but the actual infrastructure with Chef, Puppet, and um, Ansible has become pretty well defined. Um, migrating between clouds, that's like cloud bursting. Um, I know public cloud storage, well, that's pretty straightforward. Everybody has your OneDrive or Google Drive, and um, if we look at what's added, it's these pretty, you know, pretty not revolutionary things. So cloud has been around for a long time. Service mesh, I quite like. I will discuss that later on. Repatriation means you go from the public, maybe because you're cheesed off with it, back to the private cloud. Uh, we AI platform as a service is just the middleware to support artificial intelligence, obviously important. And security is always slightly boring in my opinion, but always critically important and very good to do work on. If we look at some selected innovations, then um, we have private cloud computing. That is computing done using cloud software and cloud ideas, but not on a public cloud, but on some set of computers isolated, so you have complete control. We've already described Cloudlets, which is effectively a micro cloud. It's designed to sit near edge devices, which are near it, because you're got, whenever you have an edge device talking to a computer, the, for many cases, like when you're when your car is about to collide with another car, you better make certain you get response quickly. That's actually why cloud cars, when they're deciding what to do of that type, they will just use the computers within the cloud. Within the car, sorry, they will not go back to the cloud to decide how to avoid a collision. We already discussed multi-cloud, and here is service mesh, which is sort of interesting. It is the the software ecosystem supports different services talking to each other between uh, different cloud vendors and between different service types. And um, it, there's messaging, um, you have to send messages because services always in, are instantiated by messages. And there are all sorts of things like load and balancing and security and things like that. And then finally in this uh, lesson we have the Priority matrix of cloud computing, well, I'm really going with the hype matrix, so this is the same words. It's, look to, it's good to see what's transformational. <coughs> it is these two key ideas, cloud computing and software as a service. Those are in the two year time frame. They're just done. Edge computing, well, it's pretty well understood. Deploying it will be hard because it will just take a long time to put all these devices on the edge and decide which sensors you want where. Platform as a service is the is the middleware to build applications provided as a service. That was pioneered by clouds, in my opinion, that should be adopted by people like the high performance computing community, but has not been. Uh, when we get to the high, well, we do have an AI platform as a service. I like cloud native, which is the Say how to use clouds the way they ought to be, distributed clouds, IoT, and uh, building reliable sites. Containers need to be managed. I've discussed cloudlets. We have to manage services. We have to uh, probably do hybrid cloud computing. I we do have to do how? Quite, I say the issues that are a little frustrating, because they're in some sense easy, but. Um, here we have infrastructure service. I'm not certain why it's only high, not transformational. It's been around forever. It was the foundation of the original Amazon cloud. And multi-cloud has been around for a long time, although because you know there's no motivation for the different vendors to offer the same API for a particular feature. So moving between clouds is non-trivial. And um, here we have these moderate and low. I'll let you look at that. Private cloud computing, they only view as moderately important. Perhaps because um, actually public clouds are pretty secure. 
I mean, there is a rumor they're not, but actually the data doesn't obviously support that. All right, let's get on to the next lesson. Thank you.